I'm delighted to welcome back again one of our most popular guests on Words of Wisdom, the very fabulous May Pang. May, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I can't believe it's been months. Wonderful. Thank you. And at the time of recording, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the British invasion. May, you were 14 at the time and living in Spanish Harlem, I believe. What were your memories of the Beatles landing at uh, JFK and their first appearance on the Ed Sullivan show? You know, I thought, who are these guys that just took over the, the, um, the charts, you know, because we all had all these American uh, bands, you know, uh, you're talking about these singers, you know, from Bobby Rydell to Frankie Avalon to even Pat Boone and, and the Beach Boys. And all of a sudden it's like the Beatles. And I said, who are these guys? And, you know, and I was curious and I remember that they're going to be on Ed Sullivan. And I said, oh, I got to watch. And in those days, you didn't have as many channels as this. So you go, OK, fine. And I just remember, oh, my God, the minute I saw their faces, I just remembered going, oh. I love them. I love the way they sound. I love the way they look. I love um, everything about them. So to me, it was exciting. I said, this is a new sound for me. It didn't sound like the others. And I thought, I can get into this. I watched, and as I watched, I remember going, it, it really affected me. And I, like millions of other girls, started crying for no reason. I don't understand why. You know, I'm just sitting there going, oh, my God, how wonderful. Although everybody in my my school and, you know, being 14, they all thought I was a little nuts, but that's OK. So it was a combination of the music and the looks for you when you first saw them. Oh, absolutely. I thought I was so glad it was long hair. I thought everybody looked great with long hair. I still do to this day. The cool cut look was just out. I mean, you know, um, so I was really uh, loving every minute, the whole look. I just loved every minute of it, you know, just watching them. So they did uh, five songs on that first show on the, the 9th of February. In the first half- If you say so, if you say <laughs> so, because I don't remember a thing. I'll, I'll, I'll remind you, I, I actually wasn't watching. We didn't get it in the UK and I was still a fetus at that stage. So I didn't see it at the time, but I believe they did two halves, um, All My Loving, Till There Was You and She Loves You in the first right. half. And then in the second half, you had I Saw Her Standing There and I Want to Hold Your Hand. A very diverse set of songs. W- what struck you the most about their, their song choices? Well, you know, I didn't know much about them because I hadn't bought their records yet. I mean, I immediately went out and obviously after seeing them, I was like, I'm out to the record store. Um, I, You know, it's just their sound. It was just their look, their look really grabs you first. And then it's like, oh, who are these guys? And then you hear the rest of it and the, the way they interpret their songs and the way they sang it. And you go, oh, this is, this is new. And, you know, and I kept listening to it and I, I couldn't get enough of them. Don't know why. You know, when you think about it, you go back and you look and you go, what made them? And, and it's those four guys, that combination. You know, it was... Uh, you know, Ringo, John, Paul, George. It's that combination that created this. And I don't know if if it didn't happen with others. It just happened with those four. And they opened the floodgates to all these other um, artists that came out of the UK. And all of a sudden, we all wanted to learn about England. I wanted a pen pal, you know, they had, it was, it was quite funny. I wanted a pen pal out of England. I wanted to learn more about the English, you know, a way of life. Uh, I think I got more than I bargained for originally now that I go back and look at it. Um, But, you know, I don't regret any, not one second of it. Well, the Fab Four performed, I saw her standing there on on that evening. And of course, you were you were very much there at Madison Square Gardens, the last um, public performance that John gave together with Elton John of the same song, which rather sort of neatly takes us back to 1964. Did, did you imagine watching the first Ed, Ed Sullivan appearance? You'd be watching sure, that. I would hear that. No, yeah. I mean, it was funny because when they were choosing the song, um, they were trying to choose a, you know, an encore song and, and Elton and, and John are standing there, you know, they're thinking about it. 
and John can't say, let's do this song. He goes, it's a song, you know, I haven't, I don't do, you know, and it's just easy and uh, let's do it. And that's how it happened. It really was no thought to it. It wasn't about, you know, anything. I know people like to read into why and all that, but it isn't. It was just like, let's choose something, you know. It's fascinating why that did spring into John's mind. Do you think the, the fact that he, it was the first public appearance in the States that was his mind thinking back to that on some, some, some I don't, you know, I don't think so. I, mean, I just think that he wanted something simple, you know, for this band to do nothing complicated. Right. I mean, it wasn't his band. So it was just like, and we only had a few hours of rehearsal. That was it. So, you know, not making it complicated uh, for the evening. Um, you know, th they they had one night where Elton couldn't rehearse this, uh, that all the songs. So it was just really um, just a, a, a quickie, as it were, you know, they didn't have days to say, hey, let's let's do this and maybe we could do this. And it, it was rehearsing with the band, the horns. I mean, I remember Elton saying, I wanted the band uh, when they did whatever gets you through the night in the horn section, they said, I wanted every note to be exact the way John had it on the record. So there was no surprises. So if there was a bum note in there, they learned that one to go with it, you know? So it was just, it was, a um, it was just one of those nights and, and it made it easy. And it was a fantastic evening. So what, what were the rehearsals like? Did they go smoothly or? Oh, yeah, it was very relaxed. They came in, I think it was only like three or four hours the most that, you know, that they had for everyone came in. Let's practice this. Let's just do that. Even though it's, it's, uh, uh, but, you know, John didn't play with the band and the band was tight because they were Elton's band. So it was easy for them to do one thing. But once they put John in the mix, that was another thing. And then also you had uh, to do this other extra song on the side. That was, a, that was another thing. I think for me, it was exciting. I stood on that stage where John could see me and not many people realized I was standing there. And I was standing right near beside, uh, right behind Elton and near the speakers. And the, the feeling of what it's like to be a performer that night was absolutely amazing. The floor, I really thought I was gonna go through the floor because you could feel the the um, the stage going up and down as people stomping. It was, I, I, I couldn't even describe it. I could feel it just going through my body. It's a great shame we don't have any video from, from that evening. Did, did John I, give I, you any- I know. Did John give you any sideway glances or was, was he just focused well, on playing and focused on the audience? No, he did. That's why I stood on the stage. He said, please stand somewhere where I could turn around and see you. Because I know that if you're bopping, I'm fine. <laughs> so that's why. So I stood, I, I stood off just to the, to the, it's a, when he glanced for, uh, from looking right, his right, then he, he could see me. He said, I knew it was all right when I was standing there and I started dancing. <laughs> you don't recall if anyone was filming at all? No. There was no filming there. We didn't, there was no talk about filming that night. And I guess um, in lots of ways, it's whoever from the audience that did it. Um, really, I am surprised that that no one thought about it. Well, it's before the days of camcorders and smartphones. Yeah, sadly, wasn't doing it? this. And, you know, to do that, you really, um, they would have to have really got, and it done really quickly because it wasn't so simple like now grab your iphone everyone you know was it a complete surprise to the audience or did somebody were there rumors circulating that john might be there there were there were rumors already there were rumors but everybody says oh i don't know you know and it was just a half half and but um because i think elton did uh was it two shows maybe? I'm trying to remember. But what it, no, he couldn't have because it was Thanksgiving. And um and we spent Thanksgiving uh day uh meal together. There was a group of us, and then uh and then we went to that night. And so yeah, there was a I there was some circulation, but nobody was sure. And <laughs> uh 
boy, did it raise the roof. And um, it was even getting into the limo. It's scary because you can feel the floor just going up and down. And at that point, I said, I just want to get out of the auditorium just in case it was going to collapse. But going back to, to 64, we've got a bit sidetracked about 10 years later. Um, uh, did you collect any Beatles memorabilia when you were a kid? You know, such as gum cards or pins or anything? I like? still have them. You still have it? Oh, wow. I still have them. I I found um, uh, little pins that I had because Ringo was my favorite. Now, you know, that's that's the funny part, you know. Uh, and I told the story um uh, recently because I you know little things spark memory you know coming back to me um I remember standing I was doing something and I hear so who was your favorite Beatle and I went you know I said oh Ringo and then I just went I turned around and I looked and I went you are asking when I was 13 right and I got no answer. And I, I asked again and it, no answer, except, uh-huh. And I thought, who would have thought, years later, who would have thought that I'm going to be asked, who is my favorite Beatle by another Beatle? So I got very upset and <laughs> thinking, and I kept saying, we are talking when I was 13. Um, and of course, we saw Ringo that night, and I thought, oh, okay, maybe he won't bring it up or just let it go. And um, John goes, oh, by the way, you were her favorite. If the ground had a hole in it, I would have jumped into it because I was so embarrassed by that. Well, Ringo wasn't the most popular Beatles in, in the UK. Oh, yes, he well, was in America. In the UK, he wasn't so much. But what particularly appealed to an American audience about Ringo? I, For me, it was the blue eyes, that sad blue-eyed bit, you know, for me. Because, you know, my colouring and his colour were complete opposites, right? So I don't know. But in America, he was the most popular. So Maybe it was Ringo's was vulnerability. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it was his uh, the appeal of, of his, you know, sad puppy eye look, you know, and that whole thing. I don't know. And um, sadly, there's another anniversary coming at the end of this year, this time the 50th anniversary, when John finally signed the documents to dissolve the Beatles. You were there with Johnny. Bizarrely, yes. Disney World, Florida, strange place for the Beatles to, uh, to terminate. What do you remember about that day? Oh, God. Well, say, you know, strangely, as you say that, you know, but what happened was supposed to be done um, like the week before, roughly the week before in New York uh, at the Plaza Hotel, because Paul was there. George was there doing his Dark Horse tour, finishing it up. Ringo had already signed it and he was on the phone. So waiting for John and uh John didn't show up. Did he send a balloon along in his place? Is that true? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no. What happened was that they noticed John wasn't there. And uh, our lawyer called and he said, what's going on? I said, John's not coming. He says, what do you mean? And I said, and this is after several years of you know negotiation with like 40 people at a table. And uh, and I and John just felt I said we use the we use the phrase stars aren't right. But the thing was, John, um, there were some clauses that he still didn't feel comfortable. A lot of it about taxes. Uh, where, you know, he would be the one responsible because he was the only one living in America at the time. So the dissolving, and he was going to be the one responsible for over a million dollars worth of taxes. And he says, that doesn't sit well, that didn't sit well with him. Let's put it. So, um, and so the lawyer said, okay. And he went back in <laughs> and he told the room that John wasn't coming. That didn't go over very well either. So, um, you know, so things like that happened and George called. And uh, I just remember I said, hi, George. And I said, do you want to speak? He goes, no. And he, he just just gave me an earful. But in that earful, John was listening in on, on 
to the phone. <laughs> so um, and he's so we we it, it got fixed at the end. It got fixed. Um, they all Paul and Linda came over the next day to say, "What's your concern?" And you know we all have to work with us. You know we all work together. So Paul and Linda were over. We said we're gonna. Um, you know, John said, we're going to go see uh, Linda's father, who was one of the negotiators for that end. And, you know, talk. and so we were all getting together. And uh, we did, and it all worked out. And uh, the lawyers and, you know, everything was worked out. And the lawyers came down when we were having our, um, you know, our, our winter holiday with Julian. And it was down in, down in Florida. So here the coming with you know stackfuls of contracts because everybody thinks that the contract to end the Beatles is just one one piece of paper but it is also all the assets from Apple and and recordings and publishing so there's like and then you got to get to give to everyone an original copy so there's lots and I'm sitting there and I'm and John's going come on take the camera let's do some photos so I took a few and it was so dark, but um, I managed to get uh, one where, where John, I don't, I didn't even know what I had. So I got John in his signature, mid signature with his hand signing it. A unique moment in history. Yes, um, definitely unique. And so uh, there was no two ways about it. I think for, for John, I think for the whole, for the whole group, it was, a release, a tension, um, because then they could go do other things and still be together if they wanted to. It was just that the old contract was holding them back. It had dragged on for such a long time, four years, hadn't it? Yeah, so you could see. And, you know, you could see the hostility. No one's talking to one another and all this is going on. This way it really freed them. I know it was sad, but it also brought them back together again at the same time. Sure, sure. And uh, you were staying in the Polynesian Village Hotel. Right, in Disney World. And uh, our host who uh, who, who um, organized it was uh, the famous um, record owner of, of for Roulette Records, Morris Levy. And how did you celebrate that evening? I don't Which want to go into all the details of the celebration, but... <laughs> I just think that it was um it was a release and we were just there for Julian and we wanted everything to just be that, you know, not think about the 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 um anything else about the contract. It was over, done. Next, let's just move on. And then we came home and then it was like, oh yeah, Paul and Linda came over a couple of weeks later after everything was done. And actually, uh, now it's February, but just a couple of weeks ago, I was just in New Orleans. And 49 years ago, this is where uh, Paul and Linda came over for a visit, telling us, oh, we're thinking of recording. And John goes, where? He goes, oh, down to New Orleans. And it piqued his interest, you know, John's going, really? He goes, yeah. So uh, after he left, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting there and John the next morning as he's playing his guitar and coming up with whatever. He says, I got to speak to you. I got to ask you a question. And I'm like in there doing work. And I said, what do you want? And he goes, what would you think if I wrote again with Paul? You know, you're like the exorcist. My head just spun. So, and you know, and I said, are you kidding? That would be great. And he said, uh, why? I said, you know, solo, you guys are good. But the two of you together, that's another story. You take that to another level. You're that you can't be beat. He's good. Okay. Was yeah. it hard to answer that question objectively as a fan and also, also as a partner at the time? Because uh, as a fan, we all wanted to see the Beatles get back together. Well, most people did. Yeah. But, most uh, would it did. necessarily have been the best thing for John? I don't know. But he was the one who was willing and knowing how he, his writing and knowing Paul. It was now a new start, let's put it that way. And I think they could then go on to doing something that wasn't um, that wasn't forced. 
It wasn't a contract that was going to hold him. And we didn't tell Paul we were thinking about going down. We were going to surprise Paul, which of course never happened. But I did tell Paul years later and, uh, and I told Linda and um, he said, oh, sure, sure. You know, what did I, you know, what I said then, you know, had no proof, but um, what was weird was like a needle in the haystack. And I always say the angels are watching out. Paul, uh, a, a year later or so, this is like um, when he was celebrating uh, the Buddy Holly party in New York. And he came in and he said, uh, you know, the Zoffs called, come to the party, whatever. I saw them come in. They had just gotten off the plane. And in those days, the Concord, you know, they had just flown over. And uh, they came up to me and they go, and he's going, Linda, did you tell her? He, he goes, and she's looking at, he goes, how could I? I'm with you. So, you know, we walked in together because I didn't have any time. And he said, what? I said, what do you trying to tell me? He goes, you know, you told us about New Orleans. He goes, well, we found a postcard that Derek Taylor was uh, selling or whatever. And he goes, it said it was, it was a postcard from John to him saying, thinking of visiting the Max in New Orleans. Something that never knew until I mentioned it. And now there was also proof that we were thinking about it. One of the tracks Paul was recording in, in New Orleans was, was Junior's Farm, which John might have played on had he had he made it down there. Did he hear that song subsequently? And what did he think of it if he did? I don't know. That I don't know. Because it was shortly thereafter that because we never went down, we we split shortly thereafter um, because of circumstances. So we never talked about it. So I don't know. You did stay in contact uh, over the years, right up to, to John's uh, sad death. Did, did he talk about Paul's music much in those calls? No, we didn't talk about that. I just said, um, you know, did, did was, I was more concerned about him being in touch with Julian than I was about him with Paul. That was just more, you know, to me, that was more uh, concerning to me. I didn't want him to lose uh, the relationship again, you know? So Paul and John could fix it. Julian and John was another story. And that comes over in your mag magnificent movie, um, The Lost Weekend. That's the last time uh, we, we spoke. Um, how, how has that uh, film been received? Critically, it's been well received, but- uh... Absolutely, it's been great. Yeah. Uh, the one thing is that a lot of people had no idea what my involvement and where I stood. I mean, even today, I, I got a message from a musician. They go, I always, I always knew of you, but I only thought you were with him for a weekend. <laughs> and I said, and these are musician friends that I've known for years. They still didn't know until they saw the movie that, that it, they went, oh my goodness. You know. Well, it's available on Amazon. I urge everyone to go out and watch it. Great film. May, thank you very much for joining us today. You've been absolutely amazing, as always. And uh, take care and speak to you soon. Okay.